Okay, let's talk about blocks of elements. So I taught you in the last chapter where the S, P, Ds, and Fs were and the periods numbers 1 through 7. So we want to follow this when we're labeling the highest energy sublevels. The first example I give you is hydrogen. Well, only 1S is filled with hydrogen, so you want to write down 1S. Sulfur. Sulfur ends on 3P. So 3P would be the highest energy sublevel. Okay, um, cross out nickel for your example. We don't need to be concerned with that. Okay, um, now why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because we're going to be talking about core and valence electrons. Okay, so I taught you how to do electron configurations in the last chapter so that you could um, apply it here. The core electrons are the electrons that are like inside closer to the nucleus. The valence electrons are the outermost shell. Okay, so they have the highest number in front of the S, P, D, or F sublevels. Okay, so they have the highest principal quantum number, which we talked about being N or the periods on the periodic table. Why do we care about valence electrons? We care about valence electrons because they have to do with bonding. Okay, so let me teach you a little trick for figuring out valence electrons and I'll show you how to do it the long way with your electron configurations. So if I'm looking at this periodic table and I'm looking at anything with an A above its group, okay, any element in a group with an A above it, look at the number, or sometimes it's a Roman numeral, in front of the A and that tells you how many valence electrons it has. Okay, So anything in 1A has 1, 2A has 2, 3A has 3, and so on, all the way over to 8A. The only exception here is helium, which is in group 8A, which is in this corner. Technically, it only has two electrons, so it couldn't have eight in its outermost shell. Okay, but let's do a practice problem. Let's take a look at student exercise number nine. Write the electron configuration for phosphorus. Okay, so phosphorus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a note of the highest energy level so it's a three okay so the electrons that are in the third energy level are the highest those are my valence electrons so here those are my valence electrons I have five of them if I add the two and the three together okay so there are five valence electrons and then everything else is a core electron right so all of these electrons here that are in the 1s, 2s, and the 2p are my core electrons. So I have a total of 10 core electrons. Now remember, the easy way to do this is to look at phosphorus on the periodic table, which happens to be in an A group. It's in group 5a, so therefore it has 5 valence electrons. That matches the result I got here. Okay, let's do student exercise number 10. Student exercise number 10 wants the valence and core electrons for selenium, which is SE. All right, this is kind of a long one. This is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. Now I want to figure out my core electrons and my valence electrons. So I'm going to underline the highest number, which is a 4, in front of the S and the P. That means that the electrons that are there are my valence electrons. So if I add together the 4 and the 2, I get 6. So I have 6 valence electrons. That means the electrons that are in the other sublevels must be my core electrons. Okay, so there they are. Now if I look at SE on the periodic table, which is right here, it's in 6A. So that means it has six valence electrons, which matches what we just got here. Okay. Student exercise 11 wants you to refer to the periodic table to predict the number of valence electrons for an atom of each of the following. So I'm just going to write down 
all of the elements that I have listed, and we're going to go through the periodic table and do them. Sodium is in group 1A, therefore it has one valence electron. Aluminum, aluminum is in group 3A, therefore it has three valence electrons. Sulfur is in group 6A, so it has six. Xenon is in group 8A, so it has eight. Helium is in group 8A, but it is the exception that I told you about. Technically, it doesn't have eight valence electrons. It only has two electrons, and it's in the 1S, which is its outermost shell, so it has two electrons, okay? Student exercise number 12 is just kind of some practice on electron configuration and noble gas shorthand, just so you don't forget it. So we can do a few of those, and then we'll move on. So we've got B plus 3. Remember, the plus 3 really means I lost 3 electrons. So you have to go back 3 boxes, which puts you at helium, so your electron configuration would be 1s2 or helium in a bracket. If I'm doing O negative 2, that means I gain two electrons, and that puts me at neon, so I have the same electron configuration as neon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then I can put neon in a bracket for the shorthand. If I'm doing calcium with a positive 2 charge, the positive 2 charge means that I lost 2 electrons. So go back 2 boxes, and that puts you at argon. So now we have the same electron configuration as argon, which ends on 3p6. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p6, or it's argon in a bracket, okay? Okay, now, um, you have a worksheet where I ask you to identify valence and core electrons. I forgot to bring it over here, so I'm going to grab it really quick and explain it. So it looks like this. The top half is exactly like what we just did. The bottom half is a little bit different. So if you have checked out a textbook, you'll notice that it doesn't talk anything about orbital diagrams. Okay. So I put it on this worksheet because it's commonly seen and um, it's sort of a visual representation of electron configurations. So if we're doing an orbital diagram, like let's say, let's pick an example that I just did, okay? Um, let's do sodium, for example, okay? So the electron configuration for sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, I'm sorry, 3s1. Looks like this, okay? Since each s holds two electrons, we have one single box for each S, okay? And then for P's, you're going to have three boxes. And then I'm going to include one more box for my S, like this. So this is an orbital diagram. And inside, I put half arrows to represent my electrons, okay? So here I've got two electrons in the one S. So I'm going to put a half arrow up and a half arrow down representing my two electrons. The electrons spin in opposing directions. That means they're pointing in opposite directions because they're the same charge. I've got two electrons in 2s, so I put a half arrow up and a half arrow down. You can never have the half arrows pointing in the same direction. Okay, 2p, I have six electrons. Now, you have to fill each box or orbital singly first. So I'm going to put one in the first, one in the second, one in the third, and then I can go back and I can pair them up like that. All right, so that is called um, Hun's rule. 
Okay, Hund's rule says that each orbital has to be occupied singly first with one electron before I can go back and double it up. Okay, and that works for orbitals that are degenerate. Yes, I said degenerate. Degenerate. Okay, so degenerate means that the orbitals have the same energy. So when you've got three boxes, those are three orbitals, and those are going to be for all the p's. So like 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, and so on. All of these boxes or orbitals have the same energy level, and we as chemists call them degenerate orbitals. If I'm doing um, any of the d's, like 3d, 4d, 5d, where I'll have five boxes because they hold 10 electrons total, then all of those orbitals would be considered degenerate as well. If they're all for 3d or all for 4d, etc. Okay, now in the last orbital, which is 3s, I have one electron. So I'm going to put my one half arrow in there, and that is my orbital diagram. So make sure that you know what Hund's rule is, and then make sure you know something else called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that when I have electrons occupying the same orbital, those electrons have to have opposite spin, so you will never have electrons pointing in the same direction. That would be considered wrong. Okay, so that's how we do orbital diagrams. And now you're ready to go on and do the worksheet. If you have any questions, just ask me.